Okay, so this is a presentation whose title is Roman Language Diversity to Bias. And while the, the main scientific problem of this talk um, has general application, I will focus on a specific sub-problem, which is how these issues apply to under-resourced languages, namely those languages which are talked by the majority of the population, majority of states worldwide, and which are different from the countries and people who have uh, enough resources to live well and develop research innovation more easily. So this is the index. Roughly speaking, we divide the index in three parts. The first part, we just introduce uh, the main problem, what I call the digital language divide, while the second problem, uh, second item is um, how the digital language divide creates problems as it introduces bias, meaning disadvantages towards uh, low resource languages. And then ultimately, I propose uh, our own solution at least a partial solution to the problem. The digital language divide. Once upon a time, we were all talking about the digital divide. That was in the early days of uh, information technology. Now with the web around, a new type of divide has, has appeared, what we call the digital language divide. And the issue is that uh, uh, not so many languages are actually present in the way they should be in the web. And so now the question becomes, in a world which is globalized, where most people are on the web, how the fact that you just speak a given language, that you have a certain given native language, affects what you can do in the web. And also remember that uh, this issue is not only a personal issue, it's also an economic issue, because uh, clearly, if I speak a language like Setswana from South Africa, and uh, and economically, I uh, have an economic um, um, uh, service. Then, uh, if it's given a language, then it's not present in the in the web, and that not so many people can understand. Then it's going to be hard for me to do what I'm, uh, I want to do in the web, which means most of my work will remain in the real world, which uh, doesn't seem such a good idea in a world which is globalized. So this uh, initial phase actually starts uh, from describing work from a report which was uh, published by The Guardian in 2015, around May, based on the, um, on the report done from the Oxford Internet Institute. I think it's still very valuable. I think it still conveys the main idea, even if clearly the ideas are somewhat uh, obsolete. So as of 2013, as you see, the distribution of languages in the web, and, um, and you can see the number of, um, of users. Clearly, you can see the fact that um, the languages which are most present are the language for those people who speak uh, um, uh, when, for those languages for which there is a, a higher number of speech of, of spoke, um, speakers. Now, but then if you have um, this distribution of, of speakers in the world, now the issue here is given the distribution of speakers, which are potential users for our technology, or for the internet technology, how many languages or which languages are maintained in the web. So clearly the state of the art, the most advanced technology in the web is provided by Google, and Google has been pushing this idea of language translation, language support in the web now for years. And in 2012, Google was supporting around 30 European languages. Now, the situation has much improved, as now 
in 2020, Google does um, support like 150 languages, not only from Europe. Yes, but as from the most recent statistics, there are more than 7,000 languages in the world. So the issue now is, is what about the remaining around 7,000 languages, which are beyond these 150, which are supported, number one. Question number two is, uh, what are the consequences for these languages not to be in the web and not to be supported by Google? Not being supported by Google clearly means that um, um, the language is not, so, is not supported or hardly supported by the Google search. We do not know the details, but that is most likely the case. It also means that most likely for those remaining 7,000 languages, their, their impact on the web is not as, uh, as widespread, as uh, in, impactful as the number of speakers um, for those languages would uh, um, require. So to give an idea now, Let's just see a couple of slides here, which give an idea of the phenomenon. And again, these slides, again, are coming from the Guardian article and report. So this is um, a picture which uh, um, represents the articles which are geotagged uh, in Wikipedia, Arabic Wikipedia, means that part of Wikipedia used for the Arabic language. As you can see, um, despite being Arabic Wikipedia, the locations which are used for geotagging are largely European and even more US. The bottom line being the most likely um, from the point of view of the web, even for Arabic-speaking Arabic users and, and, and um, data providers, the most relevant information is in that part of the world. If we go to the next slide, then we check the, the two pictures here. One is the geotagged articles in Egyptian Arabic Wikipedia which is on the right and you pretty much you see the same phenomenon with a very small number of uh, locations which are in in egypt which are most of them all around uh, the nile but if you look on the left side of the slide and uh, this is uh, the results of a search for restaurants in West Bank, number in Palestine, based on the language spoken. As you can see, um, the results are very diversified based on the language which is used. And actually, you can even notice that uh, there are actually more hits for English and Hebrew than for Arabic, number one. And number two is that uh, the results are very different which means that uh, the language, which is a good witness for the culture, really uh, uh, differentiates on the results. And here again, it's very clear that uh, the, the language spoken in, in the West Bank, which is Arabic, only partially uh, uh, captures what's going on in West Bank uh, even if here we're not talking in restaurants, I mean, if we could argue that, um, if we go back to the previous examples, articles in Wikipedia are more general, generic, so they depend on the uh, scientific authors or the topics. So in a sense, they are less bound to everyday life. This is clearly not true, but one could argue this. But clearly, when we go to restaurants, I mean, this is not the case. So we are saying that uh, the language speaking on the web has a major effect on so on matters which are really local and uh, and relevant to the life that everybody lives. Not only 
if you now you're talking about restaurants and clearly as we all know the search has a big impact on on, uh, on where you go for for um, for a restaurant so it also means that uh, the language you speak has also a big economic impact because uh, it's a, it's a higher there is a higher probability that uh, a language that a restaurant which is returned from a search um, will actually be the place where you go for lunch or dinner. So there is a fundamental issue. So now we notice that there is a, a digital language divide, which is, uh, uh, it seems that at least for the cases, so the examples I gave you, that there is a somewhat kind of a, uneven distribution in the way the languages are represented uh, in the web and um, so now the question here is how big where is the problem and by the way ultimately given that if you now take the google 150 languages um what's going to be the the future for all the other for the other languages and by the way how many languages are, are they so as I said before, um, even if we around, around, we have around seven thousand languages in the way in the web, the top ten thousand languages make up eighty percent of the total content on the web. I don't know how correct this figure is; it might be wrong, but I think it does capture uh, the um, situation. And I also believe that. Um, the situation is getting worse and worse. And, uh, and clearly, many languages are slowly disappearing. In a globalized world, and in particular, if you want to be a citizen of the globalized world, if you want to do economics, if you want to do business in the, in the globalized world, the being or not being on the web is not a detail. And in fact, uh, as of 2019, uh, 19, the UNESCO World Atlas of Languages shows that of 231 languages in the world that have disappeared, 37 are from Sub-Saharan Sub Sub -Saharan Africa, which is uh, one of the areas of the world which uh, are less rich. And clearly, as I said, uh, the phenomenon uh, of, uh, of disappearance of the language is a big economic impact as a big culture impact. And uh, I already gave you the example of the restaurant uh, on the West Bank, but I think it's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. So let me dwell a little bit more into the issue of uh, this uh, um, digital language divide applied to the fact that um, all the languages are very diversified, generates bias, which means um, an, uh, a problem, uh, a negative effect on the languages which are not so present uh, in the web, what we now call low resource languages. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that we all know that the languages are different. We know that Italian is different from English, which is different from Chinese, and so on and so forth. But, um, and, and this, of course, is the first kind of difference. I mean, we do not use the same words, the same syntax to describe the word in different languages. And this, by itself, is already a, um, an important problem because if you do not know the right word, you, you know, like if you don't know the right word in Chinese, for instance, in the web, you, don't, you cannot query for that one word. Well, and then people could say, okay, you just get a dictionary, and then, um, and then um, like for instance, in English, Chinese uh, dictionary, and then you get the Chinese word, assuming that you know to type it in, and then you do the search. But, uh, and this clearly is already uh, effect, and, the, and the, this difference in syntactic 
um, shape in, in the syntax and in the single words is already a problem for the web. But things are actually much worse than that. The difference in syntax and in wording is only the tip of the iceberg, as I said, because there are much deeper problems. So here in this slide, um, I show the results of two searches that uh, I did in Google um, Images just yesterday. And uh, since I'm Italian, I just uh, use my own culture and what I know about Italy. And I do know that in Italy, we are very good in food. And I do know, being Italian, and that in Italy, we have a lot of special types of hotels or restaurants for that matter. Anything which has to do with hospitality, tourism, quality of life. So you see what I did, I typed on, on hotel, and I got the images on the left, and I typed uh, Agritur, which I got the images in the, on the right. So now, what is Agritur? Agritur is, a, is, a, is a, an Italian type of hotel, uh, which is um, characterized by the fact that to be a, an hotel, which is uh, um, uh, uh, located in the countryside. Uh, in fact, you can see it, uh, or the, the agritours are near, uh, you can see greens, you can see sea, you can see um, blue skies, while on the test you just see what really looks mostly a city um, uh, like picture. And in fact, Italians go to agritours a lot, actually, they are one of the fastest growing business in Italy, and they've been so for the last years, because people get out to cities, they just want to go and relax in the countryside. And uh, this is exactly why people go there, and this is why actually agritours are doing so well. Now, what is the bottom line? I type the agritour because I'm Italian, but if you're not Italian, if you do not know that agritour is a type of restaurant, then if you type it from anywhere in the world, you only get hotels uh, on the on the like in, you get in the left hand side because of course you cannot type uh, hot, you cannot type agriture because uh, you don't know the word you do not even know that there is a notion of agriture in Italy and uh, therefore you get a standard hotels okay Italy is good in hotels but um, I don't think that uh, the kind of hotels you get on the left. Are in Italy are so much better or different than the kind of hotels like the ones you get in the left in India or in China or in the US or in any other else in, in Europe or in the world. So you see, what is the bottom line? The bottom line here is that uh, if the word agritour is not in the web and if it is not connected to the word hotel, there will be no way that uh, international tourists would be able to even understand the notion of agritour. So you see here is this an, is really an issue of, of uh, not only culture, but economics, because as Italy, I think we have a much better chance in competing when we boil down to agritours than we go down to hotels. So in this way, we really showing that uh, what makes Italy or Italian language different from the other country is exactly in those words which are not present in the other languages. So these are people call lexical gaps, and there are many others like malga or even pub, which is an English word for something that you don't find in Italy. And malga is an Italian word for something you don't find in the UK or in the US. So you see, language is not only a matter of syntax, it's also a matter of culture. It's also a matter of describing uh, with language, what you see, since language does not describe only points to what it denotes, then if you don't able to link uh, a foreign language to your local terms, which most, most of the time will not be present in the other language, there is no way by which what is, makes you different, what makes you unique as Italian or as a, a South African or as any other country will be ever present in the in the in the in the web, but it's even worse than that. There's another query. This query we do have um, the result of search for Cyprus, 
So Cyprus is a is an island, of course, part of Europe in the Mediterranean Sea. But you see here the, the, the game was I type Cyprus to Google Images um, using uh, the, the English version, the Greek version, or the translation, of course, or the Turkish and you, uh, version of the word Cyprus. And you see what you get is very different. So, for instance, you can see that the um, in the in the in the British version, I mean, there is a bias or a focus, as you want to call it, uh, towards uh, vacation. Most likely, people in the UK think of Cyprus as a vacation place. But if you look at the Cyprus version, the, Cy the Cypriots know that uh, in Cyprus there was a big problem, and there is still a, but there are some kind of issues between Cyprus, between half Turkish and half um, uh, um, with Greek culture. And you can see in these images where there are like the country split in two parts, even though there is one picture of the blood. While if you look to the Turkish, the Turks you don't see, don't seem to see, at least from the images, this kind of separation problem. And they see Cyprus more as a, as a place with towns. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that if your language is not present in the web, even yourself, is represented in different ways by the others. And if we don't have Greek, in which case we do have it, the word for Cyprus is over Cyprus, you kind of lose or miss the opportunity to represent Cyprus as you see it. Of course, um, any representation of anything is good, as long as uh, it is ethical and so on and so forth. So the UK representation of Cyprus is okay, as well as Cypriot version of Cyprus is okay, as well as the, the Turkish. They are all viewpoints. But I do think that um, in this perspective, having the possibility to represent what you are in terms of your land, uh, your culture, your food, your monuments, your everything, is a fundamental, is a fundamental fact. Because uh, yes, given that everything is a viewpoint, um, then I think uh, the, your viewpoint about yourself should have uh, a little more uh, relevance than the you point for the others. And of course, this does not, does not apply to Cypriots or to Cyprus only, it applies to everything. So the bottom line is that uh, being present as a language in the web is a fundamental uh, um, issue that you must guarantee if you want to be able to say who you are and what you are in the web, and not let, and not let the others define yourself. So, now we do understand that, uh, I hope that uh, uh, there is an issue of, of web presence. And now the question here is, I said at the beginning uh, that there are 7,000 words, uh, sorry, there are 7,000 languages. I said that um, only so many languages are represented uh, by Google, provide translation, um, and I said that uh, there is a problem when language is not represented in the web. Now the, the issue is what happens when you have a, a language which is not present in, in the web? Usually uh, language presence in the web means that uh, you are available uh, like um, dictionaries, online dictionaries of some form, and that are available, is available technology for doing natural language understanding and parsing. So um, a low resource of language is a language for which uh, either, uh, no, uh, which, uh, not either or, but um, some of the elements which are needed to use a language uh, in the web are not present. So, and uh, this is what I'm gonna now talk about. And I'm gonna talk about briefly of the issues which come um, with this problem. So first of all, there are many ways uh, in which a language can be under-resourced because uh, there are many um, objects you need to make a, a language fully exploitable in the web, which will go from multilingual dictionaries, corporal data and um, language sentences, NLP, tools, machine translation tools, and so on and so forth. And um, 
Let me say that uh, there is nothing new in what I'm saying in saying that there is an issue of under-resourced languages because now it's become a very important hot, top, uh, hot, hot topic uh, in um, a REC, which is one of the major conferences uh, uh, for applied NLP um, for publishing research work. And um, there is a lot of interest in many other areas, like in deep learning, Google Translate, and so on. So, but what is the bottom line? So the bottom line here is, if we go to the next one, is that um, 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 just take one application, machine translation. Machine translation is good because, as I said, if suppose, suppose that uh, you have a website, clearly you, you are in South Africa, and you, you write information in Setswana, as you should do because the local people are your first customers, then if there was a machine translation, then you will be able to make your website visible to everybody else. So even assuming that uh, your own language defines your main target customers, then being available in other languages is good. Now, the bottom line is that the state of the art in machine translation, which is based on deep learning and, um, and um, does not apply well to low resource languages. Why? Because uh, deep learning, which, as I said, is a state-of-the-art in machine translation, requires a lot of resources. So it just goes against uh, against the basic fact that low resource languages are, by definition, low resources. Low, uh, we have low resources. And um, okay, so people said, okay, but then how can we do? And this uh, started a new line research which is people call cross-lingual transfer learning. So the idea is, let me give an example from Europe, a European language I know better. If I have, a, if I have a, a lot of data, for instance, in French, and then, uh, and if I don't have a language, a lot of data for Italian, then I can use the French to help translate the Italian based on the similarity or the non-diversity or the unity of the two languages. Or let me give another example. If I have a lot of data in Italian, which you, as a matter of fact we do, and if I want to translate, um, I wanted to translate uh, uh, some dialect, then I can use um, Italian to, to do this kind of stuff. And in fact, the idea is really to put them together and to really explore the similarity across languages to really be the translation machinery where you build what's called a cross-lingual embedding that then you, you later on you can use as more language. However, this seems a very good idea, but in practice it's very limited um, application because uh, um, the big language basically dominates the small language and um, you see anything which is specific, I think of the example of the agri tool that I made before, are just deleted because if you have a word like agri tool in the small language, and since you have no corresponding word in the other language, then simply that specificity is lost. By the way, this is a very key point because someone could say, Who cares? I mean, I still have hotel. Yes, but as I said before, the, this is not a point because, um, as I said before, in terms of hotels, Italy, I don't think, does much better than any other European country, while in terms of agri tour, it does. So you see, if you think about it, about it, those words, those meanings, those expressions, which are specific of a language, are specific for a reason. And what is the reason? The reason is that that one culture has something important, which is unique, which is exactly what makes it different and unique and therefore valuable to everybody else. Clearly, any two languages have a lot of things which are different, but they're just different, let me do a syntactic, not very relevant ways uh, to say in different ways the same thing. But since the world is diversified, since we're all different, which is good, then the most relevant diversity, the most relevant differences are those for which if I have something on one language, the word agri to in Italian, then I don't have a corresponding, a corresponding word 
or expression in the other language. And this is exactly the bottom line. If you really want to build a, a, a new world where, which is inclusive, where everybody can bring to the world their own culture, their own richness, then this issue of the natural language divide and to deal with this is really becoming a major issue. Because if this will not happen relatively soon, the young people will start talking the new language, they will have no, word, no words for the old traditions, and a lot of these traditions are going to be lost. And by the way, I'm not saying anything new, this is already happening. But what I'm just saying, that any easy to think way of dealing with this problem, which is like uh, transfer learning applied to uh, machine translation, does not work. Or at least does not work exactly for those parts of the diversity of languages, which is actually the most important. So given that, I think I'm now dwelled enough into the problem space. Let me just say what is my own or my own group approach to the problem. And uh, the approach is to represent diversity, which is how is it then we can provide a general approach where we um, allow for unity and diversity. Unity means there are things which are common everywhere. I mean, there are mountains pretty much everywhere. There are, there is sea pretty much everywhere or ocean, for instance, when I was, um, I went for the first time in California, I had our time using ocean and instead of sea. To me, sea and ocean were the same thing. Or the first time a Mongolian student of mine came to me, he just came to me and said, uh, you know, in Mongolia, we don't have a word for seaport. Why? Because the Mongolians don't have a sea. They don't have the sea and therefore they don't need, the, don't, have the, don't have a seaport and therefore they don't need the word seaport. So you see, for any two languages, or for any group of languages, there is some element of unity because we, most of us, have, a, I mean, all of us, I would say, have trees of different form. Um, uh, all of us eat food and drink. Most of us mountains or sea, but then there is diversity. The mountains are different and the food are different, so on and so forth. So the fundamental issue here is how do we represent this kind of diversity? The approach that I'm, I'm pushing, which is a very ambitious approach, I don't know whether I'll ever succeed, but uh, I don't care, at least I've tried. So uh, work locally, develop local language locally. I don't think it's up to me to develop Mongolian languages. To do that, I need Mongolians. Also because even if I can get uh, some of these languages from the web, then language something like a biological, phenomenon, it evolves. I mean, I can't, it only, it only be a Mongolian who can develop a Mongolian language. These apply to all languages. So my own idea is that I need the collaboration for people who speak the longer language and each language, one group. And that's the only way to do it. If you really want to build the unit of the diversity, you just cannot do it yourself. You're just going to say that, okay, we're going to do it for everybody. No, you need, you need the people. And then, but then you're assuming that you find this kind of collaboration, you have to coordinate globally. And, uh, and uh, the key point is really how can integrate languages in a way to build diversity awareness in the system. Diversity awareness and also unity and awareness. I'm not pushing the emphasis onto unity awareness because this has been the default. For instance, if you talk in terms of lexical resources, if you think of all the applications, very valuable, which have been developed uh, for all the current languages. First of all, most of them apply only to the rich countries, number one, and pretty much all of them use English as the hub language, which is, which is, if you want, if you give me a word in another language, you have to give me the corresponding meaning in English. So the coordination really goes to the point of saying, okay, to coordinate means that they have to have a word in English for what you're saying, which, by the way, defeats uh, uh, the problem of using uh, the, or exploiting the, exactly the high value of diversity, like uh, what I mentioned with agriculture. There is no there is no word for agriculture in English, and if I translate agriculture in English, then I become hotel, and then it loses exactly the added value that I have as hotel as as agriculture. And not only that, I think the th the third point right now in AI and natural language processing. 
there's a lot of emphasis on automation. I think that's good, of course, but um, typically if you want to do this kind of work properly, you need to involve people. And this is why I think the crowdsourcing is a key technology. Semantics are in the head of people, but it's only people can tell us what, uh, what is the meaning of a word, what experiential, experientially a word means. So this is our own approach, which is uh, let's try to capture the unity across languages as well as the diversity and with the help of people. It must be people who have their local culture. So we developed a methodology and a website called Linguarina, which is really the main goal is to develop a language diversity. And uh, we divide it in a bunch of, um, in a bunch of um, items, sub items. We develop a large scale integrated multilingual lexical resource, which will a UKC for Universal Knowledge Core. We develop measures of language diversity. This is very important because, as we see, once you have a representation of diversity into the resources, knowing that um, some languages are different or the same, or the degree of, diver of diversity allows you to do a lot of help. For instance, take French and Italian. I mean, lots of uh, Italian and Spanish, even more. Lots of words in Italian are very similar to a lot of words in Spain, in Spanish. You can really do a lot. Not only that, uh, we, once you start making language diversity a quantitative phenomenon, you can really start doing studies, uh, which are not only linguistic studies, which not only have, uh, have um, um, uh, scientific impact, but also economic impact. For instance, we did some experiment and we took a parcel for, for Spanish and we applied it to Italian. The results are not so bad. Clearly, if we apply the parts of Chinese to Italian, we'd have no hope. So the, this point of, of not being too diverse, not only as a, as a long-term application, uh, applications, but also in the short term can have uh, alleviating the problems of missing resources and technology. Then, of course, there is an issue of incompleteness or, or correctness that these resources that we develop, they will never be complete, they will never be perfect. Why? Because for many reasons. First of all, there is no such thing as Italian. I mean, all of us speak different Italians, and that applies to all the languages. Not only language evolve with the culture and the world. So we are in a game where we are developing resources, knowing that the resources are going to be never perfect. But uh, as I usually say, between perfection and zero, or better, between zero and perfection, there's a lot of different grade levels and of course striving for perfection even knowing that we we'll never reach it will allow us um, to really approximate as much as possible um, the kind of quality that we need to eliminate the bias which is now existing which is now exists and is huge in the web towards under resourced languages and by the way a lot of case studies and um, and lexical gaps. So Agritur is a lexical gap for English, which is an Italian word which is not present in English, and pub is a lexical gap, not anymore because now in Italy also called pubs pubs, but used to be a lexical gap, because we do believe that lexical gaps are a fundamental uh, phenomenon in uh, which must be captured in a in the in a in the web just because it's one of the key means by which we we capture the local culture. Uh, this work has been part of 2017, there are the details. I'm not going to get into the details here because it, this talk is mainly focused on the overall picture. So let me see, I think this is very important uh, because this, I think, uh, is a key property of uh, the UKC. Let me remind you that UKC is the resource that we are developing as part of the Linguarina methodology. You see, the, you can see here in the in the video that there are a lot of uh, IDs, like uh, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And these are concepts. So here, one, two, three, four, five does not really mean, uh, uh, means one, two, three, four, five, means anything. It is the intended meaning that I wrote in English here is that facility. So it could be a restaurant, it could be a pub, it could be a malga. These are kind of 
sub items, right? But this is intended meaning in English. What it really means this item is that somewhere, like take Malga, Malga means that somewhere in Italy there is a, some something that I can see, most likely a restaurant, a building, a house in the middle, usually for being a Malga in the middle of the mountains. That if I take a picture, I would say I would tag this as a picture. As the same way as I tagged ugly, the pictures I showed before you with agriculture. And there is another word which is pub, which is most likely, if you look, at, look for in Google Images, we take a lot of British pubs. So, what is the key point? The key point is that we have a uniform way to represent one thing, pub, which is in the UK, and another thing, which is mug, which is in Italy, then to say that both of them, both of them are facilities. And they like Malka being a restaurant and so on and so forth. So you see, this is a space of meanings, and these meanings are integrated. And these meanings are our best approximation to the world, because after all, Italians and, and, and British live in the same world, and Italians go to the UK, and the British come to Italy, and when the Brits come to Italy, they see food, most likely Italian food. Most likely Italian food will be different from the British food, but does, have, does serve the same purpose of feeding people and giving them energy to survive. So you see, this uh, concept space, what we call the concept core, does capture in a, in a language independent way, the fact that we all uh, uh, live in the same world. And this is fundamental because it's also fundamental because it does capture the idea, the fact that even if we all speak different languages, even if we live in different worlds, I mean, my friends in the UK live in the UK, I live in Italy, we do, when we meet, we actually understand one another. Maybe we don't understand one another um, exactly, but we do manage to survive. So if I food, if I ask for food, they tell me to a pub, or they will tell me to a rest, take me to a restaurant, or they tell me address for that. But they don't, they don't show me the address of a gym or anything else. And so, and so this I think is a fundamental property, as you see now. Through this pub, if you take pub, pub really means here like uh, they, they, what they wrote here, some kind of explanation is what in English would mean the pub or a saloon. But if you look into Italian, you see a lexical gap. That word you don't have, which means we do not have in Italy anything of the Italian language, which is the sound equivalent of a pub, and vice versa for, for Malga. While we both have a notion of facility, and they both have a notion of restaurant. Why? Because we all, both Italians and, and Brits, we all go out for dinner, and because sometimes we go do that for friends. So you see, the, here the unity is the diversity. The unity is in whatever is common, restaurants, the diversity in the fact that uh, different cultures just use different words. And these different words are the, the, the mirror of the fact that uh, Italians and English and British actually eat in different ways, and, they, and the places where they eat or where they stay is different. So this is what we are trying to build. This is actually the fundamental resource. And we believe that this is going to be a major step towards uh, building, um, a going beyond, uh, or at least uh, contributing to going beyond to the natural language divide. If we were able, if we'll ever be able to produce uh, a resource like this for the 7,000 languages in the world, then we will have the possibility, at least at the world level, uh, to co to make people from different cultures and languages communicate clearly is a first step towards building um, natural language aware parsing, which is what you really need ultimately to enable search or like a data integration or all these kind of functionalities in the web. So where are we? The UKC we have built it. We have like uh, one thousand languages, so we still have. Um, 7,000 languages to go, but we do have those 1,000 languages. 95 languages are African. Clearly, the coverage, I don't put here the number, but the coverage for the African languages is, is much lower, with some exceptions. There are some African languages that are very good. We have 2.5 million words, but only 7,000 Africans. But this was before we imported the, the South African languages. Now we have many more, but still are in orders of tens of thousands. But the bottom line, you have one more than 110,000 110, concepts that into another languages. You see, we have more than 100,000 
concept like this. Now, if you know that usually people say that in language speakers around 5,000, use 5,000 terms, like 10,000 terms, like 15,000 terms for people who have some, have taken some class and therefore have a rich language, we do have a space of 110,000 uh, concepts. And uh, we believe that uh, this is a good coverage uh, which allow, gives us a good space, at least uh, to facilitate uh, the interconnection of all the world languages. By the way, let me point out that these 110,000 words is not our uh, contribution. Uh, it, this is written in the paper mentioned at the bottom. These are really the using the wonderful work done by the Princeton people from the Princeton WordNet. It is a fact that uh, the the word, the first version of the word, the so-called now Princeton word, was done in the U.S., and it did have uh, uh, only for English, and it did, con and they did um, have this notion of in one hundred and around one hundred thousand meanings. The key difference, however, from the Princeton word net, that the Princeton word net did not have this notion of a linguistic or language independent concept, which is our main contribution. And by the way. The Princeton word did not need to have it because the Princeton word was only concentrated on English. If there is a contribution that we made is that we actually completely isolated. And in this, I think we are pretty much the only ones, I mean, with module variations that have done it. We have isolated this uh, language independent layer, which allows us to capture in an unbiased way or the different language of the world. And in new language, by the way, also it's very flexible because any new language come in, we don't need to do anything. We just connect the, we just create another box, we just connect. And there's another major feature. Suppose that for instance, now we have connected the 15 Indian languages. When you connect the 15 Indian languages to this, immediately all these languages are connected to all the, to, to all the other languages. So for instance, we have, or, or we now have, for like, for any word in Hindi or in Malayalam, we can, if you type the word, you can get the meaning for all the other 1,000 languages. Of course, for those languages for which we have the words and for which those words exist. So what is our major contribution? We support languages. Uh, by the way, we are not uh, like there are very usable like Babel networks, like where you integrate language and also entities. No, we don't do any. We don't do any of that. We just concentrate on language and the nouns and verbs, adjectives and adverbs. We really use high quality with the human in the loop. We don't do any automated population. We don't believe in that, and uh, we explicitly represent language diversity. And the good news. Uh, is that we're going to go online by 2020. Just a, a couple of slides before finishing. For instance, then, just to show you the science of this. So, for instance, we came up with measures because we really believe that language is a biological phenomenon and that uh, we should measure, we should be able to measure it. You should be able to measure diversity across different languages. You should measure, you should make uh, not only to do, you should be able not only to do synchronic studies, but also longitudinal studies. So, and diversity is a key measure because, uh, as I said before, how we convey to you does capture what is unique to a culture. So we, in our current definitions, we define notion of combined diversity, which is a feature which is a um, composition of two parts. One is the kind of the temporal diversity, which is called the genetic diversity, how our language evolved in time, and the spatial diversity, which is our language uh, evolved independently just because of space. Um, distance. So, for instance, these are four South African languages that we have. They have low genetic diversity because they have a common root, and they have low geographic diversity. Why? Because they're very common. Japanese, Mandarin, and Korean have a very high genetic diversity. They have different roots, but they're low genetic diversity because they're very close. Africans and Dutch have the low genetic diversity. They all come from Dutch, and Africans come from Dutch. It's very high because one is South Africa and the other one is in Europe. In this, we just take European language, we mix with an African language, we mix with American language or like a Mongolian language, both diversity. I don't, this I think is a key message. I don't want to get into the detail. These, these results are in the EGKI paper that I mentioned. 
But you see, what is the key point? The key point that the temporal diversity, you just, you just look at the phylogenetic tree, how languages are generated, and we can come up with certain measures, you can measure it. And by the way, this measure is coherent with the, the example measure that I gave uh, in my previous slide. And similar, we can do that for geographic diversity. We, sorry, I, we can say that Mandarin and, and Korean are very close geographically and they have a low geographic diversity, while uh, English and, uh, and, uh, and the Chinese and North American languages are very high diversity. And why is that diversity important? You look at the, of course, we can compute it in this way. It's a very simple measure where you just uh, normalize the number of continents involved. I mean, clearly, um, much more sophisticated measures can be given, but I think this is the idea of measuring diversity in space. And uh, why do we do that? Oh, yes, that's very useful because we can do a lot of work. We can apply this work in the automatic generation of uh, lingua, of uh, of the UKC as part of the Linguarina methodology. Because now, as you remember, I said that uh, the, um, that we believe that um, we need to use these resources and also that uh, the, there should be people involved. It could be actually experts, but even, we also believe a lot in the contribution of normal people and maybe even the computer in the automation process. So we did experiments uh, in um, where only uh, experts were involved. We needed, we needed, uh, we just here, we didn't do this work. We, we was done by some South African friends, which did an LP tokenizer, a post tag for Setsuana. We did it for, for like Gaelic. Gaelic is very interesting because it's a, a minority language, which is a lot of roots, but it slowly disappeared. And uh, we did uh, we did a lot of work um, uh, on crowdsourcing. This paper is not exactly the right uh, the right citation, but uh, we did a lot of because actually this paper does not report a lot of crowdsourcing we did uh, in this work. But we but the other papers, if you go to our website, we're going to show in a second. You find a lot of crowdsourcing papers. Then we did a lot of work in once you have the resources. Um, to develop more linguistic resources. For instance, we generated a database of cognates across languages, uh, more than 8 million. This was automatically generated by the UKC. And now we're generating a similar for the, for the morphemes. And then ultimately, um, we do, did a lot of work for Mongolian. So we did a lot of work in the Mongolian WordNet. So what is the point here? The point here is that, uh, which I was trying to emphasize is that uh, Thanks to the collaboration to other people, which is not only my group in Italy, but we do collaborate with people in Scotland, we do collaborate with people in India, we do collaborate with people in South Africa, we do collaborate with people in Mongolia, and we are doing it. We're actually building, uh, we're actually building this uh, cross-lingual, unitary, and diversity-aware, unity-aware and diversity-aware resource. And, and by the way, from a point scientific point of view, this generates papers. Which is uh, meaning by this that um, in a in a world which is dominated by the need of doing paper writing, paper writing, I think generates valuable scientific uh, results. I do believe personally, but it's my own personal view, and these kind of results will have a long-lasting effect toward in the future. And this is one kind of research that I'm really proud to do, and I hope I'll have a lot of other colleagues collaborating in this. I do hope to collaborate with it to not to collaborate, I do hope to convince people with this talk, then there is value in doing this kind of research. One last slide. So, so what is the next step? I mean, I really see three lines of research. This is a kind of research with somewhat hybrid. Clearly, we do have a research. We really want to study lexical gaps. I mentioned the importance of lexical gaps before. I really want to do this major long-term goal. I really want to connect uh, the concepts of a language into, into pictures. Um, I gave you the example at the beginning of the multiple ways by which Cyprus is uh, indexed by filters, or dually, if you think of the aggregate example, the importance of language in the tagging. 
And they do believe that the state of the art, very useful, like image in it, uh, is very important, but it's strongly, it's not that they believe, I know that is very strongly biased because it is in English and, uh, and it was generated based uh, on English language and English sources. So what about the rest of the world? I want to do technological innovation. We are applying a lot of applications. We are using universities as our case study. Why? Because, as they usually say, you have to eat your own dog food, which is how can you convince the others to use your technology for first to don't use it? If you go to the website, we're going to show in a second, we'll give a lot of papers about this and work that we've done. But, and then we want to do social innovation. In a global world, I think this issue of unified by diversity is the future. Um, and I do believe that we should do it in a different way. We should concentrate on what we call non-weird languages. Weird languages is not a term I invented. It's a term that I got some linguistic paper, but weird means well-educated. Um, industrial, rich, and developed countries. I think it is, it's, uh, it's mandatory for us as human rights to really um, preserve the richness of the culture, of all the culture represented by the more than 7,000 languages. And I'm saying we're not doing this for doing them a favor. We're doing ourselves a favor. None of us is perfect. And none of, none of us knows how to do everything best better than everybody else. So they, we have all learned to we have all to learn from the others. And I think that uh, by doing this uh, kind of approach, not only we do, not only we publish, not only we feel good because we help other people that maybe are more in need than, than us, also long term, but also do, do something good to ourselves. So to conclude. This is what uh, I'm doing. All the ideas uh, that uh, I described can be can find in this website. Uh, as you find out, uh, um, this uh, foundation to be is not there. I'm getting, I'm preparing for it. I think I need a little more data, a little more convincing arguments for that. Uh, but uh, we're going to push this soon. You see that we're collecting data with a focus on unity and diversity for both language, which was the main topic of today, the Lingualina project, and the knowledge. You see another project called the Life Schema project and behavioral data. Because I really believe that the diversity is the one asset that we all have in our world, the main richness of the world. And uh, I believe that um, if you really take diversity for, for real, you just cannot do it by yourself. Uh, you're 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 identical to yourself in any moment in time, and uh, if you want to capture the diversity, both synchronic and and longitudinal and <clears throat> in diachron diachronic, then you need the help by the other people, the other institutions, just because they have something that you don't have. You they are different from you. So, and I do believe that the way to do this is to do both research. Because in this moment in time, research is crucial, but and innovation, but we're innovation not only technological innovation, but also social innovation. So the website, the datascience.eu, we provide you a lot of information. I hope this talk convinced you to give a look at this. So this concludes my topic, and I do believe that uh, this path from natural language divide to language diversity, to bias, and the resource languages convinced you that uh, this is an interesting project for you, at least to give a look at, and maybe hopefully in the future to participate. This is a project which is open, open to everybody. There are no boss, no coordinate, no nothing. We just coordinate and work together. Thank you very much.